Thank you, Tina, for that very kind introduction. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be uh, here in the library. It's true. It feels so cozy and uh, great when, it, when there's no one in here and it's just us. It's wonderful. Um, I'm here to talk about this fantastic book, Midnight in the Dragon Cafe, and I'm going to be talking to Judy about it, and hopefully you'll, you'll find out what it's all about and you know, you'll get one. It's, uh, it's a fantastic book about a Chinese family, and the issues it raises will resonate with anyone who came here from somewhere else. Even if you didn't, you'll love this book. As we know, in a city as diverse as ours, that includes a lot of people. You know, uh, my parents came from somewhere else. It's also a great read. It's a beautifully, beautifully written story about a young girl coming of age and the sometimes very painful lessons that accompany growing up. I'm going to bring up Judy in a moment to read from her book. But first, to get us in the Dragon Cafe mood, I'd like to introduce some members of the Starlight Cantonese Opera Company. They are going to give us a taste of what Su Jen's mother listened to when she dreamed of home. It's an aria from the White Goddess Opera. Let's give them a hand. Wasn't that fantastic? It was just marvelous. I'd like uh, now to welcome Judy Fong Bates to the stage where she will do a reading from Midnight at the Dragon Cafe. Come on up, Judy.
thank you so much for coming. Someone asked me if I was nervous, and I arrogantly said no. <laughs> there you go. It just goes to show you know you. I'm not nervous. I've only forgotten my book. I've almost forgotten my glasses, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, thank you so much for coming. Um, when I was um, a kid growing up um, in the small town of um, Acton, um, the um, great thing to do on a Friday night, if you really wanted to have a good time, was to go to the library. Now that I'm in the big city of Toronto, it looks like things haven't changed. If you want a good time on a Friday night, go to the library. Um, before I do my reading, I would like to thank a number of people. Um, I'd like to thank um, the Toronto Public Library uh, for choosing my book and for organizing all these wonderful events. Um, and I'd like to thank all the sponsors who have been involved. But in particular, I would like to thank the CBC, the Toronto Star, McClellan and Stewart, and oh, Toronto Star, CBC, McClellan and Stewart, and the TTC. That's it. Yes, thank you. In case any of you haven't seen the streetcar with my book on it, I really do need to thank the TTC. Um, and in particular at the TPL, I would like to thank Tina Sobrotniak and Joseph Romain, who have worked very, very hard um, in putting all this together. Now, the reading that I am going to do tonight um, is at the very beginning of the book, and it's when uh, Sue Jen um, arrives in Toronto. And it's her first impression of Toronto. And this would be Toronto in the mid-50s, mid about 1956. And it may be a Toronto that some of you no longer recognize. Aunt Helen and Uncle John lived on, and Uncle Jong lived on Darcy Street in Chinatown in the center of Toronto. The first thing Aunt Helen showed my mother was her refrigerator and her electric stove. I didn't know anyone who owned such luxuries, but Aunt Helen told us that in Canada, all the lofons, that would be Westerners, all the lofons had them in their homes, and that most of them even owned cars. When I asked my mother if my father had a car, Uncle John laughed and said, only lofons, we Chinese are too busy saving every penny we make. Your father would never spend that kind of money on himself. He's the only person who could make a monk look like a spendthrift. But now that you and your mother are here, Su Jen, maybe things will be different. Well, the adults sat in the kitchen and talked late into the night. I went to sleep in the sitting room on the couch that Aunt Helen folded down and covered with sheets and blankets. It wasn't quite flat, and when my mother came to bed, I kept rolling into her, into the long crease where the back where, where the back and the seat of the sofa met. She tossed and turned for most of the night. At one point, I woke up and found myself alone on the couch. My mother was standing by the front window, gazing into the street below. I got up and stood beside her. She put her arm around me, and together we looked at the strange landscape. The solid row of houses across the road was dark, and there was not a person in sight. The street was coated with white. I had never seen snow before. It looked so smooth and even that I wanted to run out and touch it with my hands. I wondered if something was wrong with the trees, all those bony looking branches without leaves. Everything was so still except for Uncle John snoring in the next room on the other side of a heavy cloth curtain. In the morning, my mother put on one of her new dresses. Uncle John and Aunt Helen took us for dim sum at a restaurant down the street. The yards in front of the houses were still white, covered with snow. I bent over and scooped some up in my hand. It was cold and light. I tossed it in the air, surprised by the way it fell apart and fluttered to the ground. Although the walk from their house was only a few blocks. My mother and I shivered in our thin wool coats in spite of the extra sweaters we wore underneath. She looked around at the gray sidewalks and the piles of snow. It's so cold, how can you stand it, she asked. I felt the same way, said Uncle John. Take some, it takes some time, AC gun, but you get used to it. 
My mother pursed her lips. I, I suppose you're right, she said, and then added, it's so quiet here. So few people on the street compared to Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, my mother had always held my hand in a tight grip whenever we walked down the street. People pressed in so closely that we were both afraid of losing sight of each other and being separated. It gets more busy in the center of Chinatown, but the cities in Canada are never as crowded as the ones back home, said Uncle Zhang. Here, there's plenty of space and room to breathe. Wait until you get to the small town where Su Jen's father is. It's even quieter and not many people or stores. It's more like the village back in China, except much more modern, of course. And it's safe here, said Aunt Heilan, not like in China, where we worried about bandits in the country and pickpockets in the city. Here, there are no bandits, not even beggars. Ayya, those ones in Hong Kong with the gouged out eyes and the bad smell makes me queasy just thinking about them. I thought of the men we used to see in their filthy, ragged clothing, some with missing limbs, and I was glad to be far away. Mo sao, mo sao, no need to worry about beggars here, Su Jen, said Uncle Zhang. There are no beggars in Canada. This is a safe country and a good place to grow up. When I came, I was 16, too old to go to school, but not too old to learn English. You, though, you are especially lucky to arrive so young.